Love versus love bombing. Love. Love is a deep bond between two people that is built on mutual trust and support and includes being treated with honesty, respect, and appreciation and grows deeper over time. In a loving relationship, a person feels a sense of safety and security. Love bombing. Love bombing is an intense and almost immediate artificial bond manufactured by an emotional manipulator. It is built on manipulation and lies and usually involves constant communication and compliments, false flattery, future faking, mirroring, and rushing intimacy. The goal of love bombing is to get the target to trust the narcissist so they can use, abuse, or exploit them for their own selfish desires. Love bombing is most commonly associated with cults and online scams, especially dating scams. However, it works very much the same way with any emotional manipulator that has their sights set on any type of target for any reason, usually money, sex, public image, social status, convenience, or sadistic fun. It's common for those who have been in an abusive relationship to mistake love bombing for love, especially if their ex was selfish, unaffectionate, inattentive, or outright rude, abusive, or inconsiderate. If anything, for a person who has been so emotionally and physically starved out, love bombing, does not, only, love bombing not only does not come across as problematic, it can feel incredibly healthy and ideal, as though they've met prince or princess charming, when in fact they've met their worst nightmare and don't realize it yet. Love bombing tends to come on fast and furious, and to the target, it often feels like either things are too good to be true, as if they were fishing and the fish just jumped into the boat, or they may feel a deep sense of relief and excitement, as if this person is the answer to all their problems, or that they've finally found their soulmate. What's also common is if a person who has been the target of love bombing in the past, for them to then use that experience as their baseline for what love bombing is. Please know that love bombing, just like any other type of problematic behavior on a spectrum, is like, please know that love bombing, just like any other type of problematic behavior, is on a spectrum, and it can, and often does, come across differently with each emotional manipulator. So just because your narcissistic ex texted you five hours a day and began talking about marriage during that first month doesn't mean that this new person isn't problematic if they're only texting you two hours every day and haven't mentioned marriage. There are a lot of factors that come into play, and it's important to see them as a whole instead of trying to break them down into their individual parts. Many narcissists love bomb and some don't. Some push for sex and some aren't interested in sex. Some yell, belittle, and name-call, and some don't. It's important that we see a person's actions for what they are, and to have healthy boundaries and deal-breakers in place so we aren't using another abusive person's actions as our baseline for what's a problem. New story. When I first heard the term love-bombing, everything made sense. That's exactly what happened to me. He came on so strong, and even though it felt like too much too soon, I was so flattered by all the attention. I was recently out of a relationship with an unaffectionate man, and I didn't realize how starved out I was. I realize now that's why I ate up all the love bombing and mistook it for love. Rochelle. It's weird to think of love bombing in terms of a friendship, but that's exactly what it was. Within the first few times of talking to her, we became fast friends. Over time, all that intensity turned into her becoming controlling, demanding, jealous, and possessive. I used to joke with other people that I felt like I was in an abusive relationship, because that's what it felt like. The reality was that our friendship was abusive, but it never dawned on me that a friendship could be abusive. I thought only relationships could be abusive. It's taken me years to connect many of these dots and to realize that I had been falling for love bombing with friends and men, but now that I see it, I no longer fall for it. I have some friends and family that think I'm being too hypervigilant, but they've never been through something like this, and I've gotten to the point where I no longer try to explain why someone coming on so intense like that is a red flag. They just don't get it, which makes sense, because a person couldn't understand this until they've lived it. Shannon
Infatuation versus idealization. Infatuation. Infatuation is the first stage in the beginning of most relationships and is very normal. It is an intense period of time, usually lasting a few months, that includes wanting to be around someone as often as possible or thinking and talking about a person seemingly nonstop. However, in a healthy relationship, boundaries are still set and respected, and both people still have their own individuality, meaning they keep up with their hobbies, friends, jobs, etc. While they may spend a disproportionate amount of time with this new person, they do not make them their whole life. Infatuation does not include professions of love or talks of marriage within the first within the first few days or weeks of knowing someone, although both people may fantasize about these things. While there may be a lot of rushing of intimacy going on, there is no whirlwind that kicks up and no major life decisions, like moving in together or marriage. Oh, and no major life decisions, like moving in together or marriage, are discussed or made during the first few weeks. Both people are able to be grounded enough to realize that while they might feel that they've met their perfect partner, they are in the love is blind phase, and they don't let their passions get the best of them. While moving full steam ahead isn't always a sign of abuse, it is usually a sign of either immaturity or an empty emotional bucket, loneliness, feeling unloved, or fear of being alone. Regardless of what's driving it, it's never a good idea to go full speed into a major commitment without truly knowing a person, because everything is easy to get into and much harder to get out of. Idealization Idealization is the first phase in a cycle of narcissistic abuse, which is then followed by the devalue phase and then the discard phase, and often involves boundary pushes, love bombing, rushing intimacy, heavy amounts of mirroring, and the feeling of a soulmate connection shortly after meeting this person. The idealization stage leads to a whirlwind romance which seems and feels too good to be true, or it might come across to you or others as problematic with how fast things are moving, or because the behavior seems really rushed, crazy, or immature, because it is. These whirlwind romances often grow into tornadoes, which cause massive amounts of destruction and devastation to a person and their life. Idealization slowly starts to turn into the devalue stage, which generally moves from intense amounts of communication and compliments, love bombing, to outbursts of anger or silent treatment that is given if the emotional manipulator is questioned or challenged, in any way, either real or perceived. Subtle put-downs or name-calling, continued boundary pushes, squirrely behavior, strange or seemingly rude or inappropriate comments out of the blue, things that don't quite add up, and other signs of problematic behavior, all of which leads a person to feel more and more confused the further the relationship progresses. It's important to note that not all narcissistic relationships have a heavy idealization phase. Sometimes there isn't much of one at all, outside of the emotional manipulator throwing crumbs of attention or affection to their target. But for some targets, this is all that's needed to get sucked in. New story. I'd been in love before, but never like this, which is why I stayed for so long and which is why I had such a hard time leaving. When I did finally leave, he moved on at light speed and quickly became the seemingly perfect partner for the next woman. I realized then that that's what he does. He's an emotional con artist and goes around pretending to be his target's perfect partner when he's really mirroring all of her good qualities back to her. He doesn't love. He loves the high he gets from getting others to love him. It's so sick. I wish I could warn his latest target. She seems so sweet and innocent, but I know she'll never listen to me. I wouldn't have listened to someone had they tried to warn me either. After all, it's hard to believe your soulmate is actually Satan on his best behavior. Audrey. Normal bad behavior versus devalue phase. Normal bad behavior. Normal bad behavior in a healthy relationship is behavior that might be insensitive, frustrating, or annoying, but can be discussed and resolved. Normal bad behavior isn't intentional, provoking, or sadistic, and it does not include abuse or destructive, dangerous, or deadly behavior of any kind. 
It does not involve treating the other person with a lack of respect or dignity, and it does not include treating the other person with disgust, contempt, or aggression. It does not include chronic lies, deceit, chronic cheating, double lives, hidden accounts, racking up debt the other partner doesn't know about, name-calling, belittling, screaming, hitting, threatening, etc. Even though normal bad behavior isn't abusive behavior, this doesn't mean that it's not problematic or worthy of being potential deal-breaker. Only you can decide what your deal-breakers are. The devalue phase. The devalue phase in a narcissistic abusive relationship starts off with confusing and hurtful behavior that tends to come across in three main ways. The sweet mean cycle. The sweet mean cycle involves seeing two very different sides to a person, to where a person might think to themselves they are dealing with a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. or Mrs. Hyde type personality, aka Prince Princess Charming and Prince Princess Harming. These two sides of this person lead to an emotional roller coaster for their partner, which tend to involve good times that are really good, often over the top good, which is the idealization stage again, and bad times that are really bad, devalue, abuse, and discard stages. During the sweet times, this person can seem like the ideal spouse or ideal parent and have a charming, romantic, attentive, intense soulmate connection reestablished and have considerate, compassion, and caring behavior. They generally have this grand behavior in front of others or posted on social media so as to protect their public image and their self-created illusion that they are, in fact, a great person. The hot-cold cycle. The idealization stage can also lead into the hot-cold cycle, which is where things get really intense, which could involve lots of attention and affection, soulmate connection type feeling, and then all of a sudden communication stops or dries up to almost a trickle. When this happens, the target often finds themselves in a scramble to get that attention and affection back, wondering what happened, what they did wrong, or what's wrong with them that made this person vanish in a flash when they seemed to have such a deep connection. The fairy tale slash lifetime TV movie cycle. This is where a relationship goes from feeling really healthy, good, comfortable, and overall ideal to then finding out their partner has been chronically lying, cheating, mishandling, or siphoning household funds, double lives, hidden accounts, long-term affairs slash hidden families, etc. So much drama starts to be revealed that the person feels like their life has become a movie and they have a really hard time understanding how this could have happened when there didn't seem to be any major problems in their relationship. The common threads between each of these cycles is that at some point they are exposed to or come across their partner's manipulative and or abusive behavior, which can manifest as verbal, emotional, psychological, financial, sexual, spiritual, or physical abuse, when they confront their partner about how they are being treated, they generally witness their partner's cruel or calloused indifference, lack of sincere empathy or remorse, after they experience or uncover the abusive behavior and or what they've really been up to. News story. I stayed for as long as I did because I thought our fights were just the normal highs and lows of a relationship. It wasn't until someone told me I was in an abusive relationship and that feeling perpetually confused, having ongoing emotional anguish, and living with someone who had a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality wasn't normal, that I got the validation I needed in order to leave. I left feeling like I'd been in an emotional meat grinder. I can't believe I ever mistook any of that for being normal or for love. There's no name attached to this one. A bad breakup versus a grand finale. A bad breakup. A bad breakup often involves some degree of drama, lies, cheating, hurt feelings, name calling, blame, guilt, or immature or petty behavior. While bad breakups are still incredibly painful and problematic, they don't spiral into such extreme behavior where the other person feels like they are living in a Dateline episode or a Lifetime TV movie. A grand finale. A grand finale is often high drama and includes a lot of over-the-top chronic lying and a jaw-dropping level of deceit and lack of empathy and remorse and ends with the person realizing they weren't a partner with this other person, but they were instead a target and that they weren't in a relationship, 
but that they were in a manipulationship. A grand finale usually involves a narcissist's mask slipping and them trying to get it back in place to save face, and then it ends with their mask completely coming off. When a narcissist's lies and deceitful behavior are found out, this is when they start getting into a scramble to either do damage control or to get control back over their target. As more and more of their outrageous behavior is uncovered, the more lies and outrageous behavior are used in their attempts to regain power and control. This is the time that double lives, secret pregnancies, and families, long-standing affairs, hidden bank accounts or credit cards, hidden cell phones, fake names, stalking, harassment, secret online accounts, breaking into their ex's home, gaslighting, manipulating the children, the therapist, people at church, threats of suicide or murder, rage, verbal and or vis physical abuse, claiming to have cancer or some sort of other illness, claiming that someone their target knows is sick or dead, and all sorts of dramatic, destructive, dangerous, and even deadly behavior reaches a height the person didn't know was even possible. New story. A double life, a pregnant mistress, debt I didn't know about, thinly veiled threats, and on and on. The kicker is that we had been in couples counseling for other issues on a weekly basis for close to six months, and doing seemingly great when I accidentally found out about his double life. When the truth began to come out, I realized our whole 20-year marriage had been nothing more than a string of lies, women, manipulation, and debt that I will be forever paying off. The big lesson in all of this has been once a person shows their true colors, to believe what you see. Don't justify it. Don't try to fix it. Just run. Janice. Healthy Skepticism versus Paranoia Healthy Skepticism Healthy skepticism is when a person doesn't take everything at face value. They have a healthy degree of skepticism of others, especially with regard to things that don't add up or that seem unreasonable, questionable, far-fetched, too good to be true, or otherwise off. For example, I wouldn't invite a stranger into my home just because they are a spiritual leader, nor would I immediately trust a person who is a therapist, teacher, doctor, nurse, in the military, who is elderly, female, or whom I have a pleasant conversation with. This isn't because I have issues with trust. It's simply because I don't know this person, and all I have to go on is a single data point. Age, gender, profession, a conversation, etc. And at this stage, appropriate levels of trust haven't yet been earned. Trust is something that takes time to develop, and appropriate trust is developed slowly over time and through consistent, appropriate behavior during that time. Paranoia. Paranoia is when a person has a lot of mistrust or suspicion of others for reasons that are unfounded, such as thinking that people are watching them, talking about them, spying on them, or out to get them. After a person gets out of an abusive relationship, it's very common and normal and understandable that they would be distrustful of others, especially if they experienced covert psychological abuse, which the vast majority, if not all, targets of abuse do experience to some degree. An abusive relationship is like an emotional meat grinder, and by the end of it, a person generally feels ground up into a million little pieces and completely disoriented and confused by what happened, how it happened, how they didn't realize it was happening, and most importantly, how to prevent it from happening again. And when a person has been hurt, especially in ways that aren't easily identified by them or by others, they go into self-protection mode. This usually involves isolating themselves, avoiding others, feeling anxious in general, and feeling anxious and or distrustful of others. When a person starts feeling like this, they also question their judgment and overall sanity, as it can really feel like they are losing their mind. Many people have a hard time opening up to friends, family, and even therapists and doctors because they may feel that they aren't going to be believed, or that what they went through is going to be minimized or totally, or totally invalidated. Unfortunately, there is a lot of well-intended bad advice given to people who have been in an abusive relationship for them to get out there and start dating again, that what they've been through is a bad breakup, that they've isolated themselves for long enough. This is some seriously dangerous advice. 
If a person doesn't trust their judgment and if they doubt their intuition about people or situations, they need to be encouraged to not make any major decisions and not to date and to overall go slowly when going about trusting people and situations so that they can learn how to build trust in a healthy way. Trust is earned and not blindly given. To make the shift from hypervigilance, which is usually related to complex post-traumatic stress disorder, to healthy trust takes time, and it should take time. For a person to not easily and openly trust others isn't paranoia. It's appropriate and shows a healthy degree of skepticism. New story. After being in an abusive relationship, I had a really hard time trusting people. I felt broken and angry that I could no longer take people at face value and instantly trust them. It took me a while, but then I realized that instantly trusting strangers was never healthy to begin with. I now go a lot slower when meeting new people, and I no longer talk to men I've met through dating sites for hours before I meet them. It's a great feeling to finally have my power back and to take things at a pace I'm comfortable with. And if someone else wants me to move faster, well, too bad. Rory. A relationship issue versus an individual issue. A relationship issue. A relationship issue is a shared issue between two people that involves communication and negotiation about how to effectively work as a team. Some examples of relationship issues would be getting on the same page with developing a budget, how to fight fair, how to divide household duties, or how to discipline or reward children. Relationship issues do not involve abuse, addiction, adultery, or being treated with a lack of dignity and respect. These aren't relationship issues, these are individual issues. And people who have unresolved individual issues to this level have a lot of work to do on themselves before they can be in a healthy relationship. An individual issue. An individual issue is one in which one person has unresolved personal issues that is leading them to behave in ways that are disempowering, destructive, damaging, or deadly to themselves or others. It is impossible to have a healthy relationship with a person who has unresolved individual issues, and only they can fix themselves. We can't do the work for them. So you can drag them to rehab, therapy, church, or give them love and understanding, but if they aren't ready, willing, or able to do the work of changing, they won't change. Even if they are ready to do the work of changing, please realize that true change takes time, consistent effort in the direction of change, and the emotional insight to continually examine their behavior and to work towards improving it. And just because one person has problematic behavior doesn't mean that they are motivated, or consistently motivated, to change it. Unfortunately, people get into couples counseling with the goal of fixing their relationship, which usually means fixing their partner. And if you encounter a therapist who takes everything at face value, doesn't realize when they are being manipulated, and isn't able to separate out the difference between a character issue and a communication issue, as well as is also determined to make your relationship work, perhaps because they have their own unresolved codependency issues, their own ego needs, or perhaps they think all issues are relationship issues and are rooted in communication problems, then this can cost you a lot of time, energy, and money, not to mention it will continue to put you in harm's way and is incredibly re-victimizing. Because the individual needs to fix themselves first and the other partner needs to realize that there is no relationship, that this is what the whole meeting people where they are comes into play. If a person has manipulative and abusive behavior, then it's important to see that they in fact are being manipulative and abusive and to not treat it like it's a relationship issue. Mistaking a character issue for a communication issue is like getting caught up in an online dating scam where the scammer cons you out of your life savings and then thinking that going to couples counseling will help. The same goes for trying to reach a solution with anyone in your life who does destructive or exploitative things. Now I'm sure the scammer or abuser or whomever has a whole host of reasons as to why they do what they do. After all, we all have reasons for why we do what we do, but that doesn't mean that there is a valid reason for conning someone, or that what they're doing is somehow workable, or that you should tolerate being treated that way. 
Having an excuse, no matter what it is, if they had a bad childhood, are addicted to something, were abused before in a previous relationship, are not valid reasons for hurting other people. I know that might sound cold and calloused, but it's the truth. If a person has unresolved individual issues that are negatively impacting you and your relationship, it's a mistake to give them a free pass to continue to hurt you because of their past. It can be easy to get caught up in guilt and obligation and to think we are somehow responsible for healing someone else. And true healing doesn't work this way. Only they can do the work of healing their old wounds. So please don't lose sight of the larger picture and try to justify deal-breaker behavior into workable behavior because you feel guilty or because you are tired of being single or because you want to hang on to the fantasy that your parents can one day be the kind that your parent can one day be that kind and loving parent that you so wish they would be. New story. I thought that any issue between two people was a relationship issue and could be resolved with better communication, or me being more compassionate and being a better son. It wasn't until I heard the terms narcissist and sociopath that my mother's behavior began to make sense. That's when I realized her behavior was never my fault or my responsibility to fix, and that any communication with her was just setting me up for further abuse, which is why I finally cut her out of my life. Of course, my family thinks I'm a jerk for doing that, but she doesn't have a right to abuse me just because she's my mother. Roger. My husband had been lying, cheating, and abusing me verbally, emotionally, and physically for years and blamed me for all of it. What's worse is that I believed him. I really thought that all his issues were somehow my issues, too, and that if I could just be what he wanted me to be, that he'd stop cheating and treating me like crap. It wasn't until his abuse put me in the hospital that I really realized it was a serious problem, and that next time he might kill me. We had relationship issues, but his behavior was 100% his issue, and I'm sure he'll treat every woman in his path the same way. Of course, if you listen to him tell the story, he'll tell you how all of the women in his life abuse and use him. What makes me sick is that so many other people believe him. He even participated in a march against domestic violence last month. It's like he doesn't get that he's an abuser. It's so crazy. Barbara. Being choosy versus being chosen. Being choosy. Being choosy means to have high standards and to be highly selective about whom you choose to be in your inner circle. As far as dating goes, being choosy means to be highly selective about what kind of partner you are looking for and to spend your time with them figuring out if they are a good fit for what you are looking for. Since everyone's criteria is different, it's important to be clear on what yours are. Some examples of important criteria for a partner or a friend are kindness, compassion, openness, honesty, sincerity, solutions-oriented communication, and actions, and someone who has a good attitude about life in general and who is responsible and accountable for their actions. Being choosy is an attitude of abundance coupled with a healthy degree of self-love and a clear idea of deal-breaker and deal-maker behavior. It's the belief in knowing in knowing what you are looking for in a partner, and, while a person may be open to compromising, they are not open to settling. Being chosen. Being chosen is a mindset that involves an attitude of scarcity, that this other person is the only, uh, the only one out there for us. With an attitude of scarcity, a person is in a scramble in order for the other person to choose them for a partner, without them considering if this person is the kind of person they'd want in their life. New story. My whole life, I'd always been so focused on wanting to be liked, and dating was no exception. It was a major turning point when I realized that I was more focused on wanting people to like me than I was seeing if they were what I was looking for in a friend or in a significant other. I don't even think I had a criteria for what I was looking for. I was just so desperate to be loved and didn't even realize it. I've done a lot of work on building my self-esteem and a life I love. Now I'm really picky about who I let into my life. Candy. Setting a boundary versus threatening consequences. Setting a boundary. 
Boundaries are the bodyguards to our standards, and they are an important part of how we value ourselves. In order to understand boundaries, I think it's helpful for me to back up a bit and talk about standards. Our standards are often largely subconscious beliefs about what we expect out of life, out of relationships, and how we deserve to be treated by ourselves or others. It's worth the time to examine your standards and the thinking that led up to those standards, as most of the time our standards come from programming, from parents, religion, friends, school, etc., that we received when we were young. The best way to examine your standards is to look at what's shown up in your life, your relationships, job, income, car, etc., because everything in your external environment is a physical manifestation of your internal environment. The tricky part about standards is that they might be healthy in one area and really low in another. And because our behavior is our normal, it can be difficult to see where our low standards are. So, for example, you may have a car you really like, pay your bills on time, eat healthy foods, and have friends that are enjoyable to be around, but you find yourself continually dating, controlling, rude, crazy-making, cheating men. It may look on, like on the surface that you have high standards, but if you are tolerating being treated poorly, then somewhere along the way you develop the standard that being treated like that and staying was somehow workable and allowable. Whether this standard was something you picked up from abusive parents, society, religion, or from friends, or all of the above, somewhere along the line you picked up the faulty message about your self-worth. And while it may seem that the abuser was the one who ground down your standards, those weak spots in your armor were already there. Because boundaries and standards aren't, aren't taught, and worse, because unhealthy ideas of love and codependency are what's taught, it's no wonder that people don't have healthy standards. If you want to change your life, the fastest way to do so is to examine the people, places, and things in your external environment, and then to examine the standards you have in those areas. Bringing awareness to a problem is always a big first step. The next step in all of this is to decide that you are going to raise your standards. Get clear with yourself as far as what you won't tolerate, and if it ever happens again, you'll be out the door. Once you raise your standards, your boundaries will follow suit, because our boundaries are what we say and do in order to make sure that our standards are met. So, for example, if my standard is that I will not tolerate someone yelling at me or treating me with hostility in any way, my boundary would be to distance myself from that person and then either cut ties completely or let them know that I refuse to be treated like that and if they do it again, I'm done. Drawing a boundary with someone involves letting someone know what is and isn't okay with you, and then having some sort of enforceable consequence if they cross that line or if they cross it again. You shouldn't need to discuss the basics of adult behavior with another adult, meaning you shouldn't need to explain to your boyfriend why flirting with the waitress isn't okay, or why friending sexy strangers on the internet isn't appropriate, or why yelling, hitting, or belittling you isn't okay. A person doesn't need to be given multiple chances to behave according to your standards. If their behavior falls within your deal-breaker behavior, it is okay and healthy to distance yourself from them. How many chances you want to give someone is up to you. But keep in mind that if they keep doing whatever it is that they are doing, then they aren't really sorry. They're just sorry to have to suffer the consequences of getting caught. Threatening consequences. Threatening consequences are what many people who struggle with setting a solid boundary do. They might yell and scream, or threaten divorce, or to cut another person off, but they don't mean it. And they and their partner both know it. The reason they do this is because they want their partner to know they are upset, but they really don't want to leave. Threatening to leave and holding on to hope that their partner will change is all they really can do. New story. It took me close to 50 years to realize that me threatening to leave wasn't setting a boundary. I figured because I was letting him know how upset I was that I was somehow setting a boundary. I put up with being abused and cheated on for 32 years, the whole time thinking he'd change if I could just get through to him or if I could just become a better partner. And he didn't change. He just got worse. I will never again tolerate being treated like that. 
I come across a lot of the younger women in the support group who have a hard time being alone, and that's a big reason as to why they stay, but really there is nothing lonelier than being married to an abusive person. Rachel. News story. My mother has a pattern of dating abusive men, starting with my father who left us shortly after I was born. It was always the same type of guy but with a different name. I remember thinking when I was a child how weird it was that she kept finding all these abusive men, especially since we lived in such a small town and all my friends' dads were so nice. Now that I'm much older, I realize that her standards, deal-breakers, and self-worth were also big parts of the problem. And since she doesn't realize that her boundaries and standards are an issue, she only, she only sees their abuse as the problem. She'll continue to date abusive men until she does. She told me a few months ago that she feels cursed and doesn't know why she attracts such horrible men. It's so frustrating because I can try and point out that there is a pattern with the types of men she dates, so there must be something more going on, but she won't hear it. Mandy. New story. I recently discovered I had double standards. A standard to me is what behavior I require and expect of myself, and in turn that I actually exhibit it and live that way. How I require and expect me to comport myself, how and what I find acceptable behavior within and of myself, what I would tolerate and not tolerate and find acceptable as far as my own behavior goes. My standard list for myself is a mile long. What I finally had to accept and finally determined the problem to be was I had a completely, totally, and radically different set of standards for others, and I rationalized this easily. Since I could not control other people or their behavior, then who was I to set standards on them or requirements for their behavior? So while I held myself and my own behavior to a very high, high set of standards, I had no standards at all for other people's behavior toward me. I was, it was completely laissez-faire, to live and let live, anything goes. And I had to do this to be able to keep the people who I believed I should keep close to me and in my life and in my inner circle like my father, brothers, sister, son, long-term boyfriend, etc. What has finally had to happen within recovery is to loosen the stranglehold of my own standards for myself and to simultaneously tighten up the reins a significant amount on the standard of behavior I expect from others towards me, and in particular the standards for people who are allowed to be within my inner circle. Lucy.